In this lecture, we will learn about important biometallic alloys. As we see, there are two terms bio, metallic, which means that we, the, we are using certain metallic alloys which are biocompatible. So, in this particular lecture, we will learn about certain bi, uh, important biometallic alloys which are utilized for biomedical applications such as uh, hip implants and other things. And by bi biometallic materials, uh, coming to that, this, this, uh, there are three classifications of materials, ceramics, polymers and metals. And ceramics, they are known for their brittleness and their poor processability. Because if you take a ceramic and we just tend to drop it, it will basically break. And again, owing to their very high melting points, ceramics are very difficult to process. Uh, and then coming to polymers, polymers are very soft, but they are very highly compliant. So, they may not be that stiff, they may not be utilized, they may not be so good of a candidate material for providing a skeleton for a particular implant. And then metals, they come out as ideal combination of stiffness and the rigidity with ease in processing. So, overall we see that ceramics, they are highly brittle, though they can be used as a, as a skeleton material, but they are very brittle. So, they require certain toughness to them and because of their higher melting point, they are also poor, uh, poor processable. And then polymers, they are extremely soft and they cannot really serve as a skeleton material because of their lower stiffness. And again, they have very poor wear resistance as well. But metals come out as winners because they have ideal combination of stiffness and rigidity. At the same time, they can be processed very easily. And uh, the application of biometallic alloys, uh, it uh, basically it is very vast. Why? Because they have very good physical properties, very good strength, hardness and ductility. And they are widely used for the joint and bone implants in locations such as bone replacements, bone repairs, metal plates for fracture, like once we have, uh, if we undergo any fracture, we need certain support, so that, so that in the meantime, it can pro provide a supplement to the bone in terms of sharing the load and then it can also allow the bone to heal with time. So, that is the reason we also require sometimes metal plates and then there are some dental implants which are used as fillings and posts. They can also be screws and staples in the for the dental uh, implants and they can also form as a part of other devices such as uh, in the pacemakers and catheters, they can be used uh, for, uh, for proper functioning of the heart while, while uh, utilizing this artificial heart. So, artificial heart pacemakers, they utilize uh, metallic, uh, biometallic implants to a large extent. So, we see that the biometallic alloys, they extend their application for bone replacements, bone repair in terms of supplying the metal plates or for uh, supplementing the bone surrounding it, dental implants and as secondary materials such as in pacemakers and catheters. But what is the problem with the metallic implants? The basic problem with the metallic implants is that whether they are biocompatible or not. And secondly, since they are metallic, they can be very prone to resistance, they are very prone to wear. So, the resistance to wear is very, very limited in metallic materials. Also, metallic materials are also known for their higher corrosion. So, they have very poor corrosion resistance and again the body fluid environment is also very unhealthy because it is very severe, uh, it has very severe conditions with uh, pH varying from very low to very high and then it may, should be able to survive that particular pH as well. And uh, uh, with certain contaminants which are flowing through the body, it, it, the corrosion becomes a very critical problem. So, the overall problem with the metallic materials are its biocompatibility, its uh, wear resistance and then uh, its corrosion resistance and we will discuss all these parameters with respect to the application of uh, this implant materials. For overcoming the biocompatibility uh, issue of uh, bio, uh, biocytotoxicity, because uh, if these metallic materials, if, if, the, the, if the ions are released into the body, it can be very, very irritant, it can be even toxic to the material, to the body. So, generally there are some coatings which are applied on the metallic implants. Those can be ceramic coatings with certain porosity. Ceramic not only provides a biocompatibility, it also can render much more enhanced wear resistance to it and also much more corrosion resistance in the body fluid environment. So, that is the overall trend that the implants are basically coated with uh, certain ceramic materials and uh, this particular metal implant will uh, provide the overall structure, overall strength, it will serve as an overall scaffold. But the biocompatibility, the wear resistance part and the 
corrosion resistance part will come out basically from the ceramic. So, that is the overall problem with this metallic material and how it is being handled in the current scenario. And the overall material processing is very, very critical because we have to take, uh, extract the metal, process it, achieve something tangible and then do certain biological testing to be able to use it as a biological implant. So, the overall process flows like this, material excavation, it go, then goes to material shaping to achieve a tangible form, then the product finishing to finish it to certain scale and then do some surface engineering because we require certain uh, surface treatments, nitriding or any biological coating and then it has to be tested in vivo, in vitro and then in vivo, in vitro means outside the body, in vivo means inside the body and then it has to be marketed in, uh, it has to be marketed after some clinical trials and then it can be utilized as a biomedical insert. So, that is the overall uh, ball game of uh, utilizing a biocompatible uh, biometallic material. So, the first step is excavation. Generally, all, uh, all the metals are basically stored as in the form of oxide, sulphides and all that as minerals and then the mineral has to be excavated from the earth and then ore has to be separated, ore is a more beneficial form of a mineral that it has to be beneficiated and so that we can uh, achieve that particular ore, be able to refine it, extract it and then make it a useful material. So, first of all, we excavate the mineral from uh, various resources, wherever they, are, wherever they have the deposits and the second step is the ore separation and its beneficiation and third thing, once we have achieved the ore, basically we refine it to achieve a pure metal. So, we uh, refine it, we, ex we do the extractions or the refinement in terms of achieving a pure metal from its ore and then we optimize the composition. If we are able to achieve only iron and we want to get something of uh, iron with chromium and with nickel to get stainless steel, we need to alloy it with car chromium and nickel and then do the secondary processing. So, this particular also involves some alloy additions. So, now we have a material of stainless steel which can be utilized for shaping it or doing something else later on. So, this is the overall process of excavation. Uh, we are able to get a pure material form and we are able to alloy it with the required composition so that we have a material available for any further use. And then second part comes is shaping. And once we have obtained a particular material, like we have stainless steel now with us, we need to use, be able to use that particular form of material. It can be in the form of, uh, it can be utilized by casting or forging or rolling. We need certain tangible shape of a material. So, uh, it can also be in the form of powder. So, we can at achieve the powder via atomization or we can also crush it to make a powder. We can also do certain heat, heat treatments and all these processes will lead, lead out to material which can be utilized for shipping it to a near net shape later on. So, this particular processing, the casting, forging, rolling will yield the material in terms of some usable form or in some certain shape such as billets, such as rods, powders, sheets, etc. So, first of all, first process was to get a particular material, second process is to get it in certain usable form such as billets, rods, powders, sheets or it can be anything else. So, this particular process shaping utilizes uh, such as casting, rolling, forging or even atomization or undergoing certain heat treatment to be able to give out some useful form of the material. And now, once we have attained this particular material, now we want to refine it further. We want to make it from a, uh, there is actually a repetition of powder metallurgy, so I am sorry about that. But now, once we have the material in some usable form, either in powder or in billet or in uh, maybe any, any rod or billet, so something we have, in a, something in usable form, now we can start uh, processing, finishing it, like in term by via machining, we can have a CAD CAM design computer aided design and manufacturing, we can again melt it and then we can cast it as investment casting or if we had powder, we can apply certain pressure and uh, temperature to it via powder metallurgy, via hot uh, isostatic pressing or uh, via uh, cold, cold isostatic pressing or via co hot compaction. So, there are certain techniques which we can utilize to again make it to a near usable shape. So, we have excavated the material we have gotten a particular form of a alloy like in terms of stainless steel or it can also be titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium after alloying and then we uh, take it to a some uh, first step of getting certain shape out of it. It can be rod, it can be billet. Now, that particular rod or billet has to be finished to achieve a 
near to the actual usable form. Uh, so, we have to uh, perform this finishing step, which is nothing which can be machining, which can be CAD CAM, uh, CAD CAM, uh, uh, CAD, uh, CAD CAM uh, design, uh, design and manufacturing to a near net shape uh, product or it can also be investment casting and so on. And so, once we have uh, achieved the particular uh, preform, now we need to apply certain surface uh, uh, surface enhancement to it. Because as we said earlier that the uh, that the bio biometallic materials they are very poor in corrosion, they have very poor wear resistance, they can also be more toxic to the material if their ions are released. So, there are certain uh, or whether they are biocompatible or not that itself can be a question. So, we have to perform certain surface uh, engineering or surface treatments to it. So, first it can be grid blasting to enhance the surface uh, area of a particular bio implant and then we can also coat it with certain ceramics. Like an implant can be coated with hydroxypatite to give it a certain biological uh, biological compatibility. So, we have something called hydroxypatite which can be uh, coated onto a, a bio biometallic implant such as titanium, 6 aluminum, 4 vanadium or it can also be stainless steel and we will see uh, some part of it like how what is the stainless steel, how it is a good bio compatible material. But again the coating can also be for hardenings, we can do nitriding, carbiding, anything else and then we also need sometimes we also need porosity. Why? Because we sometimes it might happen that we need the cells to grow and anchor themselves with the particular implant. So, if the material, if the surface is very smooth with no porosity, if it is very dense, then cells may not find enough space to go and anchor themselves. So, apart from biocompatibility, the porosity can also be a very important criteria. At the same time, the implant has to survive certain wear because once we are walking, we walk millions and millions uh, of steps in throughout our lifetime and then it, uh, the particular material has to survive that particular load as well as certain wear because always the bodies are in uh, like with respect to each other, the surfaces are uh, again interacting with one another. So, the surface has to also be to, it has surface also has to be wear resistant and so these are certain uh, criteria out here. Also, it can be, it has to be corrosion resistant. So, biologically compatible, should be hard, should be porous, should be tough. So, these are certain criteria which really come out from the, this particular aspect. That the surfacing will provide all these properties, so that the surface properties are enhanced to a very large extent. So, for biological uh, compatibility, we, are we can coat it with certain ceramic material. Hardening can be, hardening and toughening can be given with certain secondary agents, which can be alumina which can be hydroxypatite, which can be zirconia and then we can, we also need to make the, surf, uh, sur the surface little porous, so that cells can anchor to it and also it can also be much, it can also be provided with a corrosion resistant coating as well. So, these are the uh, steps which are involved in surfacing to provide much more surface enhanced activity or surface enhanced uh, property to a biometallic material. Now comes the quality control that first of all we have to clean the surface, so that it is uh, free from any contaminants, then do particular inspection and do quality control to make sure that the things are within the specifications and if it is a new material, then we also need to do biological testing in vitro, it means outside the body environment, then again in vivo using some via sacrificing certain animals. So, this biological testing has to be done in vivo, in vitro, in vivo and then it can be marketed and it can also be trialed clinically on patients. So, these are certain aspects to the, uh, sur sur certain aspects to taking the product to the particular market and being able to use it. So, certain uh, certain things which are required here are cleaning, inspection, quality control and cy its cytocompatibility both outside the body and then in the body. In the body it can be, can, it cannot be done directly on humans. So, first of all the first testing is done on animals either say rats or rabbits. Once it is verified then it can go into the market and it can be tried clinically as well. Uh, so, this is the overall uh, processing cycle of a metallic implant material and then we saw that the material excavation, it is one of the very critical uh, features to see where the deposits are, it has to be particularly uh, excavated, it has to be beneficiated, it has to be refined, so that uh, material can be uh, obtained and then it can again be alloyed to achieve a usable material. So, we can uh, have a usable material with certain alloy, alloys additions to it. And then it goes for material shaping to achieve a material in the more usable forms, just billets, rods, and all that. And then this is the first step of product finishing by certain say machining or maybe say uh, CAD CAM and something like that. 
and then we do some surface in engineering so that we achieve a biocompatible uh, bio biometallic material uh, with enhanced uh, say corrosion resistance enhanced biocompatibility enhanced wear resistance and so on and these things are very critical because they decide the lifetime of a particular implant so these things are really very critical that we have a well engineered surface uh, so that it can uh, in, it can uh, it can provide enhanced lifetime of the implant this, at the same time it should not uh, induce certain toxic effects it should not be more uh, it should not wear out so quickly and uh, it should be able to serve the purpose so that surgery is not required again and again and that particular implant serves for a little longer lifetime maybe say of um, more than 40 50 60 years so that is the overall theme of doing the surface engineering and once it has been engineered in vitro testing is required outside the body environment under say simulated body fluid then it, uh, in vivo testing uh, within the body of say an animal then probably marketing it and then trying it clinically so this is the overall cycle of the metallic implant and now it has uh, come with a particular uh, usage with all the functional functionality uh, for clinical use now coming to the different uh, biometallic materials we have stainless steel cobalt chromium uh, titanium alloys and many others so these are the three basic alloys which are used very widely so we see that stainless steel it has very high strength it is highly economic and it is easy in terms of processing steel is one of the very common materials and once we alloy it with uh, chromium nickel it becomes highly usable and it is also very economically available so it doesn't pose much problem in terms of its processing so this is these are the overall advantages that is also has very high strength but it has also a certain disadvantages it has a poor corrosion resistance also it has very high modulus so how do we overcome that because uh, we don't require high modulus why because uh, once a bone is being assisted with something which has a very high modulus then bone will start thinking oh i don't have to i don't have to work it will start resorbing it back into the body because all the load is being taken by the implant and not by the bone so bone will think oh i am insignificant i don't need to work at all and that bone will basically dissolve so we need a support material which will have a modulus similar to that of a bone so that is a disadvantage out here so so the first uh, disadvantage of poor corrosion resistance is being negated in in cobalt chromium alloys that it has high strength but at the same time it has very high corrosion resistance but again they also face with the same problem that they have very high modulus and since this is a very uh, specialty alloy cobalt chromium and both of them are very costly so that brings the cost part very high so that is a disadvantage that it has very high modulus and at the same time it is very very costly so we saw that stainless steel it is good in terms of strength it is economic it has easy processing but it has poor corrosion resistance and very high modulus so it has been negated by cobalt chromium which has a better corrosion resistance but it becomes highly costly and while it uh, its modulus also remains very high so now titanium alloys come and then they have high resistance high strength high corrosion resistance and they they have low modulus so again the negative part has been also already undertaken out here but now titanium alloys they show poor wear resistance so that is the overall cycle that either the either the implant material is uh, it has very poor corrosion resistance or either they have very high modulus and once they have very low modulus the problem becomes in terms of handling the wear property of those alloys so this is a very vicious cycle that uh, the something or else is lacking in the particular material biometallic material so always we require a combination of certain materials and one single material cannot uh, it cannot take uh, responsibility of all the functionality which is uh, which is expected out of it so that is that makes this biometallic materials very complex in terms of uh, handling it and again the release of metal ion, metal ion it can induce a reaction with the body it can cause irritation in uh, in the body or it can even be toxic when released in the body so all these aspects also have to be considered while designing a biometallic material so we see that uh, there are certain materials stainless steel cobalt chromium titanium alloys which can undertake certain responsibility but at the same time they are, they also have certain disadvantage either in terms of poor corrosion resistance or in terms of uh, having maybe say very high modulus or maybe having very high wear rate so these all things need need to be balanced that they should have very high uh, very high corrosion resistance they should have low modulus at the same time very low wear resistance while maintaining high strength mechanical properties and so on 
and also their release into the body also has to be restricted. So there are certain parts to it that uh, that needs to be optimized while designing this particular biometallic materials. In this particular case, in this particular lecture, we will concentrate more on the stainless steel and as we, we see about them as we go along. There are certain other materials as well like, uh, like tantalum and tantalum is highly resistant to chemical attack and it shows very, very low uh, adversity in terms of biological response. So, it is highly uh, cytocompatible and people have even made a porous tantalum uh, sponge kind of a material and since it is highly porous, it allows cells to grow inside and anchor itself. So, that basically yields that uh, tantalum is a very good biocompatible material and it can also be very light. So, it can be used, it, it, since it is very strong material, it can be very light and then it can allow very easy movement of a particular limb or any, uh, any bone, uh, bone part. And again, metals uh, have been coated with tantalum and tantalum itself will not degrade and once it is exposed to a body fluid media. So, this tells that tantalum is one of the very stable materials uh, in, the bio, in the biometallic uh, alloy uh, state and then it has been very widely used in the clinical applications. So, we see that uh, tantalum is highly resistant to chemical attack. So, it has a very good corrosion resistance. It shows very, ad, very little adverse uh, biological response. It means it is biologically stable. It is not getting affected by the body environment. At the same time, it is not degrading in the body fluid media, which tells that it is highly really stable and it will not get released into the, uh, the tantalum ions will not get released into the body. So, tantalum has been widely used in the clinical applications for more than 50 years. Uh, say because, uh, because of its high density, it can be utilized as a radiographic marker. Because of its high density, it will appear a little blacker once we are uh, utilizing some radiographic markers. Uh, and also, it, uh, it is also being used as a material for permanent implantation in bone. And since it is antiferromagnetic in nature, it will not interfere with the magnetic resonance imaging uh, scanning uh, by MRI. So, that is also one of the reason it is also used in the vascular clips. So, its high density is good for radio as uh, very good as radiographic markers and its antiferromagnetic nature is utilized in the MRI uh, as in the vascular clips. It can it is also used for repair of the cranial defects. Also, it can uh, be very flexible and uh, for preventing the arter arterial collapse. So, it is also used as a stent material in the vascular uh, in the art arterial collapse uh, for the art in the artery regions. Uh, and again, it is used as a stent to treat bilary and arteriovenous fistulous stenosis. So, it is also good for treating certain uh, anomalies and it is also used for fracture repair and for dental application. So, this is all the wide variety of tantalum just because of its uh, very good uh, cytocompatibility. Uh, it is not able to, it, it, it is highly stable in even in the body fluid environment and because of its high density is utilized as a radiographic marker. It is also antiferromagnetic in nature. So, it is utilized in the vascular clips and it is also utilized for repair of uh, cartilages or arterial collapse as flexible strength because of its high strength, it is it can really replace all that and for fracture repair and dental applications. So, this also tells that tantalum is also one of the very widely used uh, material and there are certain other uh, metallic alloys as well, which are utilized in the biomedical industry. Like nickel and nickel based alloys are used uh, in certain uh, medical uh, treatments and devices. It, it is uh, basically it can also be present as a contaminant in the fluids for intravenous administration or they can be also released from the surgical implants and uh, uh, another, uh, other medical devices. So, they can also basically enter the body environment and they are also, but they are also again used for uh, different medical treatments and devices. So, the release can be very irritating like it can be again toxic, it can be irritating to the body. So, it can act as an irritant as well. So, this is uh, though it, it is utilized in different uh, medical treatments and devices, uh, we have to basically check the release of nickel ion into the body under those conditions. So, that thing has to be taken care of while utilizing nickel. Magnesium is a very lightweight metal and with very, very high, very with beautiful mechanical properties because its properties match to that of a natural bone. So, it can serve as a very potential biocompatible material because it is osteoconductive, it is degradable and it can also be load bearing. So, these are three very essential properties of this particular material that it can be osteoconductive, it can be degraded and it also utilizes a, it can also bear load. 
So that makes it as, makes it a structural material uh, for the body uh, for the body environment, and that is the beauty of this mag alloy magnesium. And again, aluminum also has been utilized in uh, say total lip pro endoprosthesis, which are basically made of titanium alloys. So titanium six, aluminum four, vanadium or so, and in that they were regarded as a safe and they were considered safe as far as the risk of aluminum release in view was considered. But again, others, some other studies also have found that it is basically a hazardous agent and it can also get accumulated at certain regimes of the brain, muscle, liver and bone. So there is no consistency in terms of how the aluminum is uh, reacting and how the kind of effects it is producing. So first of all, it is sometimes if it is embedded in uh, titanium alloy, it is considered safe, but it can also release and get accumulated in say liver, bone or uh, even muscle. So that can be little deleterious to the body. So we see that nickel and nickel alloys, they are good, but again they, are, uh, they can also be, they get released from other devices or through intravenous administration of some certain drugs. So their release also has to be kept under check. And then magnesium alloys, they are uh, very similar uh, to that of a bone in terms of the pr properties and they are osteoconductive, uh, they are degradable and they are very load bearing implants. So they can uh, be very well utilized as a bio, as a bio uh, compatible material. But again aluminum is, uh, it is a little iffy that uh, they do not have direct findings whether it is good or bad and people have found that aluminum can be good in certain, uh, certain conditions, it can be again bad in certain conditions. So there is still some ambiguity in terms of utilizing aluminum as a biocompatible material. Now stainless steel is one of the very economic materials because in terms of providing strength, uh, but they, poor, they have little poor corrosion resistance. So stainless steel basically comprises of iron and then chromium in the order of 70 to 20 percent, nickel 10 to 17 percent, molybdenum 2 to 4 percent, carbon 0 0.03 percent and limitations of manganese, phosphorus, phosphorus, sulphur, silicon and 2.8 percent. So overall, uh, the overall protection, the corrosion protection uh, in the stainless steel is given by chromium because chromium forms a chromium oxide which is highly impervious in nature. So this chromium oxide protects the stainless, uh, renders the stainless property to the steel. But the problem with chromium is it is a ferrite stabilizer, it means a BCC structure. So to counter that, we add some nickel to it. Nickel becomes FCC or face 100 cubic and it is much more easy and it is very ductile, it is, provides a FCC phase. So that is the overall strategy of adding certain alloys to the stainless steel. So we have iron, the major content, chromium to provide the corrosion resistance and the nickel to make it uh, to make it austenite stabilizer and in terms of rendering enhanced strength and property to the stainless steel. So once, uh, so once coming back to it, that the phosphorus and sulphur also have to, uh, they are also kept maximum of 0 0.03 weight percent and again to uh, eliminate uh, the inclusions and some oxidation, uh, oxidation uh, precipitates, a low vacuum melt can also be utilized to improve the quality of stainless steel. And then again this particular material has to be cast into some useful shapes for its application. So we have the chemical composition also can be very, very dominant, it can portray a very dominant effect uh, on, the, on the stainless steel. So uh, coming back to the again the effect of the alloying elements, that chromium, it renders the corrosion resistant to the steel because, it, because of its formation of chromium oxide on the surface which is highly impervious. But the problem with the chromium is it is a ferrite stabilizer and it is much weaker than the austenite phase. So that is the overall uh, theme about using the chromium, limiting the chromium. We would want the chromium to be as much as possible because it provides the protection effect, but it becomes much weaker because it forms a ferrite phase which is BCC and therefore the chromium content generally has to be limited and to counter, uh, counter that, to make it back into austenite, austenite phase, we add nickel. So nickel is added in, in, uh, to the order of maybe say 12 to 20 percent to counter and then make it back to the back to the austenite state. So uh, that is the overall uh, philosophy of adding nickel and nickel basically increases the strength of the austenite phase and it is much better than chromium alone. And again there is one more critical problem with the carbon. Carbon has to be very, very low. Carbon is generally limited to say around 0.03 percent 
uh, in stainless steel. So, we have carbon content much less than 0 0.03 weight percent. This happens because uh, the basic uh, corrosion protection uh, element in the stainless steel is chromium and chromium has very strong tendency to form carbide. So, it basically forms Cr23 C6 which is a carbide state and once this carbide is formed, now the overall matrix is devoid of chromium to form chromium oxide and since there is no chromium oxide, the overall material will be under attack and it will be very, it will have very less corrosion resistant. So, we see that with the, uh, that the overall theme of uh, having low carbon content is to avoid the formation of Cr23 C6 carbide and this carbide basically forms on the grain boundaries and it sensitizes the material. What is meant by sensitization is that we have certain grains and then this chromium basically co combines with carbon to form precipitates. So, these black dots which I am, I am drawing here, those are nothing but precipitates and then the interior of the grain, it becomes devoid of chromium. So, we have chromium rich regions which are nothing but the grains out here and the interior of it, it gets devoid of chromium. So, now this particular region, the, uh, the interior of the uh, particular grain is now much more prone to corrosion. And now we have a gradient that we have high chromium and then we have low chromium and that basically is called sensitization, where one will act as a cathode and one will act as an anode. So, the interior of the material can form a local galvanic cell and it can basically eat out the core of the grain. So, now we have one, one region which is very rich in chromium, which is chromium 23C6 and now the interior has been devoid of chromium and this can really form a disbalanced region or so this is called sensitization of a steel. So, that is what basically deteriorates the corrosion properties of stainless steel. So, that is the reason we want to keep a minimum content of carbon in stainless steel. So, basically we can reduce the corrosion damage to the steel. So, overall we want to keep a low, car low carbon content to avoid the formation of uh, chromium carbide and this basically uh, uh, the, it avoids the precipitation at the grain boundary and this basically is avoiding the sensitization of steel or the formation of carbide at the grain boundary and which in turn overall reduces the corrosion damage to the stainless steel. So, that is the philosophy of keeping the carbon content very low. And again, uh, the microstructure also is well defined uh, in by our ASTM standards. That ASTM uh, specifications uh, state that uh, we should have a desirable single phase austenite. So, to achieve a single phase austenite, we must add some nickel to it. And it basically says no ferrite, BCC, or carbide phase. It means keep the carbon content less than 0 0.00, 0 0.03 weight percent, so that there is no formation of carbide and chromium is available for imparting the corrosion resistance via formation of chromium oxide layer. So, basically to do, do that, we have chromium and then it is being counteracted by, it basically forms a FCC phase and that thing to, to counteract that, we add nickel to achieve a FCC phase. So, this is the overall strategy of uh, this particular thing of uh, maintaining the microstructure. At the same time, the steel has to be free from sulphide stringers or any ox oxide inclusions. So, there has to be a clean steel making or we use low, vac uh, low vacuum technique, low vacuum melt that uh, uh, we basically uh, avoid the formation of any oxides. We keep the sulphur, uh, sulf sulphur content less than 0 0.03, phosphor phosphorus content also less than 0 0.03, so that the sulphide stringers can be avoided into the particular steel. So, once you have a clean steel, the properties will automatically enhance. So, because there are no lamellas of uh, stringer or lamellas of stringers of sulphide, which will form certain boundaries and those boundaries are generally weak and then they lead to failure or maybe enhanced corrosion as well. So, uh, so by achieving a cleaner steel, we can uh, have a much more uniform uh, face as well and that will basically reduce the pitting corrosion and also it will avoid any interaction of or form formation of any interfaces between metal and inclusion. So, the overall theme of this particular uh, microstructure or co controlling the microstructure is attaining a 
FCC phase. So, so that is single phase austenite avoiding formation of any carbide so that uh, we can uh, uh, retain the corrosion resistance of a material. No ferritic phase and only austenitic phase so that the mechanical properties are superior. It should be free from sulphide stringers. We need to avoid the unclean steel making. Because the sulphide stringers they lead to uh, reduced uh, strength as well as they can also form uh, metal inclusion interfaces and it can again induce certain corrosion to it. So the pitting corrosion can be well assisted by this uh, particular uh, this particular stringers. Also, it will weaken the material as well. So this is the overall uh, strategy of uh, controlling the microstructure. Now the micro the grain size of the microstructure is recommended by ASTM again. So ASTM of size 6 or finer. It means grain size of 100 micro micrometers or less is recommended for the 316 L. It is a 316 type low carbon stainless steel and the grain size is can be calculated from n is equal to 2 to the power n minus 1 where, where capital N is the number of grains which are counted in 1 inch square at 100 x magnification and small n is nothing but the ASTM grain size which should be number 6 or smaller it means ASTM grain size number 6 or more. The grain size for the microstructure is recommended by the ASTM for uh, 316 stainless steel which recommends that the ASTM grain size should be number 6 or finer. It means that the grain size of a stainless steel should be 100 microns or less or in terms of ASTM number the grain size should be number 6 or more. So the grain size can be calculated via this particular formula that n is equal to 2 to the power of small n minus 1 where capital N is the number of grains which are counted in an area of 1 inch square at a magnification of 100 x and the small n is nothing but the ASTM grain size which should be number 6 or more so that the number of n the number of grains counted in the region can be much more or much finer. So we see that a particular microstructure will show you uh, will show us a particular grain pattern and if the grains and if these grains they are much finer or they are much uh, finer and less than 100 microns it means the grain size is number 6 or more. So we, we, we attain certain uh, micron bar say if this, say if this one uh, is certain uh, number and these grains are finer than or lesser than 100 microns then we have attained the ASTM number 6 of grain size. So that is what we are able to uh, see from this particular uh, uh, recommendation that we that the grains should be very very fine so that mechanical properties are very good and then it should be totally homogeneous it should be free from any inclusions and any uh, any uh, inclusions or any carbides and any oxides and it should be it should have a very homogeneous structure and as per ASTM recommendation n is equal to 2 to the power n minus 1. So this n is nothing but the grain size so number of grains in a 1 inch area square should be 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is equal to 2 to the power 5. So, so many numbers of grains should be visible in an 100x magnification in an area of 1 inch square for ASTM number 6. So, that is all how the ASTM grain size is calculated for stainless steel. And as the grain, uh, grains get, they get refined and the grains also need to be very very uniform because once the grains are more uniform then only the properties can be very very uniform throughout the matrix. So, we have to avoid the secondary inclusions or any carbides which can generate into the particular matrix. So, we need to have more uniform grain size as well and again the fine grains will enhance the me mechanical yield stress, yield stress. So, we this is basically given by a particular equation sigma y is equal to sigma i with an inverse relationship with the grain size. So, we see there is some frictional stress, yield stress is dependent on the frictional stress but plus some parameter which is dependent on the propagation of uh, uh, this particular uh, propagation uh, parameter uh, which can uh, uh, allow the slip, slip to occur through the grain boundaries and d it is inversely proportional to the square root of d. So, sigma y is proportional to uh, 1 by under root d and as soon as the grains, uh, grain size is getting reduced the overall yield stress will yield stress re required will basically keep on increasing. So, that is what we once we have the grain size uh, very very fine the ASTM number more than 6 then we will have the grain size very very low and as the grain size is getting lower and lower 
the overall yield strength will keep increasing and it means increase in the yield stress or the enhanced uh, mechanical property of a specified steel. So that is what the overall advantage of uh, achieving a finer, finer grain structure and grain refinement can be achieved by certain uh, techniques such as uh, rapid solidification. We can also do certain cold working which will break the grain size, we can do a rapid annealing um, and then it can also, we can also do some sort of a heat treatment or recrystallize the, uh, the particular grains to achieve even finer grain structure and usually 30 percent cold work is done which is, which is done to enhance the yield strength, enhance the ultimate tensile strength and also enhance the fatigue strength and this cold work is doing nothing but breaking the grain size and refining the grains. So we achieve a grain size of very very fine nature and as we uh, understood later that the yield strength is dependent on the under root of the grain size. So uh, this particular dependence enhances the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength. And uh, basically we will have, if we have a particular microstructure it will be very fine uh, in the transverse direction. So we will see very very fine grains uh, in a particular material and these grains are much lesser than 100 microns. So this is as per specification per ASTM that we have grain sizes very very uniform of lesser than 100 microns and that is what we will see and under service this grow, grains will undergo some plastic deformation and that plastic deformation can also be given by a cold working a 30 percent cold work and again we can also see certain slip lines. So if we had certain grains we will see certain slip lines which will generate to all which will which will basically which are basically allowing the slip to occur. It is basically for allowing slip in this direction and this can also have certain slips something like this to allow slip in this direction as well and there can be different alignments of slip and different uh, uh, this different uh, grains which will allow slippage in certain direction. So the, those slips are accommodated by certain slip lines which are predominant in the material itself and again the grain size also has to be much more finer so that uh, so, so that dislocations can get piled up at certain locations and it will basically enhance the strength. So this particular model arises from the piling up of the dislocations within a certain grain. If the grain size is very very small then many dislocations have to, be, have to be accommodated within a certain regime and then grains themselves can slide down and finer grains can therefore result better yield strength as well as better ductility to the material. And once the grains are undergoing plastic deformation we start see, seeing some uh, basically some twinning or some slip lines which will basically be present in the microstructure. So we are seeing very fine microstructure in a transverse direc direction and after plastic deformation we see much breakage of the those bigger grains into very fine grains and that thing is uh, that thing is resulted by the plastic deformation and we also see certain slip lines. Seeing the mechanical properties how they are dependent on the uh, basically heat treatment which is given to the uh, material, we see that we have certain uh, uh, specification for a stainless steel. In this case we have little higher content of sulphur and phosphorus and they basically uh, for yield to formation of uh, some sulphide stringers and that is if you see that the yield strength is around 221 mega Pascal, tensile strength of around uh, 483 mega Pascals and fatigue strength in a certain range. But as soon as we go about a better purity steel which has very low sulphide content and even lower carbon content, so now we can see that the yield strength has increased to by certain time by maybe to the order of maybe 50 percent, tensile strength has also increased and even the fatigue strength is approximately similar. So this thing is arising, as a, arising because now we have removed the sulphide stringers and we also have reduced the formation of precipitate or the carbides out there. But as soon as we cold forge it, we can see the drastic enhancement in the yield strength. It has gone from 221 to 331 to 792 mega Pascals. So these three have the similar composition and from 331 it is increasing to 792 and tensile strength has gone from 586 to 930. So this drastic improvement is achieved even via 30 percent cold work and then fatigue strength has improved in this particular case from 240 to around 310 to 448 mega Pascal. One thing to remember is the E or the Young's modulus is remaining similar or same for all, all of them because uh, the overall uh, Young's modulus does not, does not depend on the treatment or the how the material has been heat treated. It is totally, uh, it is totally dependent on the overall material property. So the totally how the bonding is really occurring between 
iron iron and uh, basically iron uh, chromium nickel and all those so the modulus is totally a compositional property and then we are seeing similar young's modulus for all of them but if we go from 30% coal forging to a very high level of coal forging we can see further enhancement in the yield strength it has gone from 792 to 1213 uh, megapascals tensile strength has gone to order of gigapascals 1.3 gigapascal and even the fatigue strength has gone up drastically so you can see what is the effect of this particular treatment in terms of deciding the mechanical properties of stainless steel so that is the overall strategy of basically designing and providing certain uh, so heat treatment or some mechanical treatment in terms of such as uh, annealing or cold forging to enhance the mechanical property via several times so apart from the grain structure this part is also very important and how the cold working work is works is like cold working uh, can automatically be generated as well like with the with the service time of a particular say bone implant screw and we see much elongated grains or texturing in the stainless steel so if we are say rolling the particular material or we are cold working a particular material we can see that the grains will start al aligning in one direction and they will be basically elongated so this is what we will observe in the uh, in the texturing or the elongation uh, part of the cold work stainless steel so we will see that the grains are elongated along the rolling direction or the form direction we can see the elongation of grains and it will be much larger and that that is actually uh, uh, giving rise to some texturing of the stainless steel but if we try to see a longitudinal section so longitude this is nothing but the texturing part along the longitudinal section but if you see a per per perpendicular to that long longitudinal axis or the transverse axis we will see that the grains are again equix so we will see that equix grains which were uh, probably less than 100 microns as per ASTM specifications so they will remain as such in the transverse direction but the longitudinal uh, longitudinal direction you can see much more elongation along the work direction so the, if it has been rolled then we see much more texturing along this direction or the grains are elongated along uh, horizontally but the transverse part will have still equix grains so that is uh, that is that part actually is being shown by this particular uh, scheme scheme of uh, microstructure development uh, how the microstructure will develop for the screw as we roll it so it will show some elongation, elongation uh, along the roll direction or some texturing and whereas the transverse section will remain as such and coming to the corrosion property of stainless steel it is all again one of the very uh, critical parts of uh, utilizing the stainless steel in, as body implants that uh, corrosion behavior of uh, duplex steel has found to be very good and again it is uh, the super ferritic st steel is also very good as compared to the uh, 316 stainless steel and it has also been suggested by a group of shiva kumar that super ferritic and duplex stainless steel can be adopted as the implant material because of their high pitting and crevice corrosion resistance so if once we start avoiding the sulfur and phosphorus it can basically enhance the corrosion pitting resistance uh, so that it can avoid the formation of certain stringers and then it can reduce the uh, inclusions and metal uh, surface contacts so that is the reason it can lead to enhanced crevice corrosion uh, resistance in uh, once we have a duplex steel or once we have a super ferritic steel and again uh, uh, again once we are uh, alloying the stainless steel with certain alloying additions uh, chromium nickel moly and all that uh, basically it, it can also lead lead to certain allergic and carcinogenic effects so this part also we have to keep under check uh, keep under check that we are uh, protecting the particular material and it is not really corrosion uh, prone and it may not lead to certain alloy uh, uh, certain ion release into the body so though chromium is uh, even hexavalent chromium is again said to be carcinogenic and then uh, chromium it provides a protection via formation of cr2 uh, cr2o3 but it basically becomes it becomes a ferritic st stabilizer so it forms a bcc structure to to counteract that we are adding nickel and again uh, to enhance certain uh, mechanical uh, certain uh, certain properties of steel uh, we are producing krill steel by addition of so moly silicon which can react with oxygen and uh, basically make the steel very much pure so again those are again ferrite uh, stabilizers as well so to counteract that we add start adding nickel and as soon as we start increasing the alloy uh, alloy concentration basically that can be very deleterious as it may lead to more chances of ion release into the body and it can be highly allergic 
because those, those ions can get accumulated at certain locations, they might cause irritation, they can be more allergic or they can even be carcinogen. So, we have to keep this particular thing under check and superferritic steel or uh, duplex steel can be used as a uh, body implant material. And again, uh, it has been observed that in the, in the case of stainless steel, uh, some infected platelet uh, fractures uh, have been studied by a group of uh, Hirloser and they have found that uh, the absolute concentration of ions as well as the nickel chromium ratio in the affected regions where, uh, where basically it has affected the, uh, the affected regions, they are basically they are richer in nickel by chromium ratio and they are richer in ions. So, that tells that the affected air, the infected areas are basically rich in either nickel chromium or ions. So, this tells that uh, these are the culprits of causing the allergy reactions. So, that is what we are able to see that uh, corrosion has to be uh, very much uh, un kept under control and because that causes allergy and that thing is uh, resulting out of some alloys, ions and the nickel chromium and that thing is again found in uh, near the infected areas. So, that really tells that these ions are really have to be kept under control and then we can uh, improve the corrosion resistance of a particular bio implant material. And uh, basically it will come out to the overall thing that for uh, initially we require uh, uh, beneficiation, the excavation of a particular material to form a, to achieve a basically pure uh, element and then do certain alloying, addition, uh, alloying additions to achieve a usable material which uh, whose composition has which can which we can utilize which is much more biocompatible and then that particular material is basically fabricated by a certain processing routes casting uh, invest, uh, casting rolling forging to achieve some usable forms such as billets sheets uh, and so on and once we have achieved that then we do certain machining to it to provide a certain usable shape once we attain a certain shape we want to give it certain coating so that the surface properties can be enhanced so, we basically utilize uh, coatings of nitrides and all that uh, for improved wear resistance, some uh, coatings of hydroxapatite for better wear and uh, for better uh, wear resistance or uh, rendering much more biocompatibility to it. And then we also, uh, so these are the overall parts which we can really uh, give as a surface treatment and then it has to go under quality control and then some clinical trials and as well as uh, before that we have to also do some animal studies in vivo, in vitro to basically comment on the overall biocompatibility and the usability of that particular implant for clinical trials. And from there on, we realize that the, there are certain materials, stainless steel, uh, cobalt chromium alloys, titanium alloys, tantalum alloys, nickel alloys, uh, magnesium, aluminum alloys and we saw there how their us overall usability is. And this lecture we concentrated more on the stainless steel part of what is the importance of uh, uh, the alloys such as chromium to impart uh, much more uh, corrosion resistance to it and other uh, other uh, other elements such as molybdenum silicon which are again used for uh, keeping the check on the inclusions and we have to keep sulfur phosphorus lower in at very low content less than less than 0 0.03 point zero one per weight percent to avoid the formation of lamellase and since uh, our chromium and again molybdenum and silicon are more ferrite formers we have to make it much more austenite austenitic in nature so for that we add much more nickel so, nickel is added in the order of 12 to 20 percent to make it again ferrite, uh, make it from ferrite to austenite and austenite is much more stronger in nature. So, that is how we saw that uh, how the transition occurs from for ferrite to austenite and then austenite is much more required form for a bio, biomedical implant and then we also realized that there is some uh, restrictions in terms of grain size because finer grain size will render much more or better enhanced mechanical properties in terms of yield strength, tensile strength, fatigue strength. And again we saw that uh, it also has to undergo certain uh, forging or some sort of uh, uh, treatment, it can be thermal, it can be mechanical, so that the grains can be reformed to a much larger extent and playing with the parameters, mechanical parameters, we can alter the overall mechanical properties of the material. It can be either annealing, it can be cold forging and so on. And then we also looked upon the overall corrosion behavior that uh, duplex stainless steel or superferritic stainless steel are much better in terms of uh, providing the corrosion resistance. But again the concentration of alloy uh, ions or chromium nickel can be found more in the uh, affected areas or the infected areas which, which, which can again be more allergic, which can again be carcinogen. So, we have to keep a check on that as well and that is how the stainless steel can be used as a much more biocompatible and as a biometallic implant material. 
So basically, we'll uh, add, uh, end our lecture here. Thanks a lot.